In this talk, we're going to review the different acquisition parameters and controls you may need to tweak when performing an ultrasound study. In the process, we'll provide you with a better understanding of what all of the buttons, knobs, sliders, toggles, and other controls on the console of an ultrasound machine do. Regardless if, if you're doing a standard 2D grayscale ultrasound or using Doppler imaging techniques like color flow or pulsed wave Doppler. But before we do that, let's discuss the ultrasound transducer you're going to select. The transducer you choose will be influenced by how well it allows you to access your region of interest, how well it permits you to see your region of interest, and if it can do the diagnostic modes you require for your study such as Doppler imaging, for example. Transducers come in different types with different head shapes and sizes. Three common types are phased array, linear array, and curved array transducers. Phased array transducers are excellent when access windows are limited, such as between two ribs. Phased array transducers provide a fan-shaped image and provide great temporal resolution which is crucial for imaging moving structures like the heart. They're also often used in abdominal and pelvic imaging. Linear array transducers are excellent for superficial structures and can offer high resolution imaging of tissues close to the skin. Linear array transducers provide a rectangular or parallelogram shaped image. Although they provide high spatial resolution superficially, their ability to image deeper regions is limited. Linear array transducers are commonly used for vascular imaging, musculoskeletal imaging, and small parts imaging, like thyroid, breast, and testicular scans. Curved array transducers resemble linear array transducers but provide a wide fan-shaped image that permit us to achieve larger fields of view and to see deeper structures. While their field of view is superior to linear array transducers, their image resolution is lower. Curved array transducers are also commonly used in abdominal imaging, obstetrics, and gynecology. Another factor in transducer selection is the frequency of the ultrasound waves emitted by the transducer, which entails a trade-off. Higher frequency ultrasound waves create higher resolution images, but lower frequency ultrasound waves can travel further and permit a greater scan depth. Other factors can sometimes influence how deep you can see in the body, such as what kind of tissue you're imaging. Imaging through fat tends to reduce penetration, while imaging through fluid may increase our ability to see deep into the patient. When performing a 2D grayscale ultrasound study, there are three parameters you need to control. Depth, focal zone placement, and gain. Depth. The depth of an ultrasound image you create is adjustable, but requires you to balance some costs and benefits. Increasing image depth allows you to visualize more tissue to a point, but will come with an image resolution and frame rate penalty. Therefore, the depth of an ultrasound image is usually set to the minimum depth needed to see what you need to see and no more. The image depth is usually displayed as vertical gradations along either side of the image, usually with half centimeter marks. Focal zones. Focal zones are a specific depth within an ultrasound image where the ultrasound waves are most tightly focused and where lateral spatial resolution will be the best. The location of the focal zone is usually indicated by an arrow of some sort along the depth markings on the side of the ultrasound image. It's possible for you to set more than one focal zone, but this comes at a major frame rate penalty. When placing a focal zone, the focal zone should be situated right at or just below the object of interest. Good focal zone placement not only creates a better 2D grayscale ultrasound image, but may affect how good your Doppler imaging will be. 
if you'll be doing that too. Gain. Gain refers to the brightness of your 2D grayscale ultrasound image. The brightness of the entire image can be adjusted using the overall gain control. But brightness of the image can be adjusted at specific image depths too, using the time gain compensation controls, which look sort of like the graphic equalizer on a home stereo system. By tweaking the overall gain or gain at specific image depths, you'll be able to reduce the amount of image noise, creating an easier and more pleasing image to interpret. A key to saving time when doing 2D grayscale ultrasound is to have the depth, focal zone, and gain settings in the right ballpark before you begin. And appropriate presets can be very helpful. And a reminder, good color Doppler imaging depends on a good 2D grayscale image. So don't forget the number one rule of color Doppler imaging. Take the time to make sure you have a good 2D grayscale image before you switch on Doppler. So let's talk about the first of the two Doppler ultrasound modes we'll cover in this talk, color flow Doppler ultrasound. Color flow Doppler is a nice way to see what the overall blood flow looks like in a large region. Color flow Doppler can distinguish flow towards versus away from the transducer and rendering this flow direction using a red blue color spectrum superimposed upon the 2D grayscale image. When flow is present, Color flow Doppler will allow you to get a sense of the direction of what flow you see, its velocity, and whether the flow seems turbulent or not. But compared to 2D grayscale ultrasound imaging, the temporal resolution or frame rate of color Doppler is usually noticeably worse. When doing color flow Doppler imaging, your transducer must do two tasks simultaneously. Create and continuously update 2D grayscale ultrasound images, and on top of that, create and continuously update the color flow Doppler image too, allowing you to see where the flow is relative to the existing anatomy. Let's say there's blood flow or fluid flow within a cylindrical conduit in your anatomy of interest. Color flow Doppler imaging is able to distinguish and visually render whether the axis of flow relative to the transducer head is approaching or receding. When doing color flow Doppler imaging, there are five parameters you need to control. The size of the color box, steering the color block, the color box, which color, usually red versus blue, you want to assign to flow heading towards versus away from the transducer, color gain, and echo right priority. Size of the color box. The size of the color box determines how much of the 2D grayscale image you want to overlay with color Doppler information. The larger the box, the slower your color flow Doppler frame rate will be. You can usually adjust the box size in both width and depth. Increasing the width tends to come at a greater frame penalty than an equivalent increase in depth. Steering the color box. We mentioned that color flow Doppler imaging can detect flow when some component of that flow vector is heading towards or away from the transducer head. But what if the flow is occurring in a direction parallel to the transducer head, so there is no component of the flow vector towards or away from the transducer? No flow would be detected. However, there's a way to work around this blind spot, and that's by electronic steering the direction of the Doppler box several degrees off axis so that a component of the flow vector becomes resolvable. Steering the color box will permit you to see color Doppler flow in a horizontally coursing vein that travels parallel to the skin surface. When the color box is steered, the color box no longer appears as a square or rectangle, but a parallelogram, since the Doppler ultrasound waves are traveling in an oblique direction. If the blood in this vein is flowing like this, you can see that a substantial component of the flow vector is now heading towards the source of the Doppler ultrasound waves. In situations where steering the box helps, but not quite enough to elicit enough color Doppler signal you're hoping to see, don't forget that you can rock or heel toe the transducer head to further accentuate the component of the flow vector heading towards the source of your Doppler waves. Color map invert. 
Color Map Invert is a pretty straightforward setting that lets you assign the color blue to flow towards the transducer versus flow away from the transducer. Color Gain. Color Gain allows you to adjust the brightness of the color you see when there's flow in the color box. In actuality, you're determining what flow velocity range you want to assign your entire color spectrum to. In this example, the flow within this vein is relatively slow, but is discernible since the color gain is set appropriately. If the color gain were set so that the same color spectrum were assigned to a much larger velocity range, the color flow within our vein becomes barely perceptible. Finally, echo right priority. When doing color Doppler imaging, color will only be painted on the pixels of the 2D grayscale ultrasound image that are darker than a particular level of gray. That means color will not be painted atop white or relatively white pixels. The echo right priority is indicated along a grayscale bar that's usually next to the red-blue color Doppler bar on the side of the image. If you set the priority to a brighter pixel level, you'll permit color data to be written on a larger range of grayscale pixels, which has pros and cons. While it can increase the amount of color filling of structures containing blood flow, there's also will be a chance for color bleeding to occur into adjacent non-vascular anatomy as well. So be careful how high you set the echo right priority. Now, let's talk about the second of the two Doppler ultrasound modes we'll cover in this talk, pulsed wave Doppler ultrasound. Pulsed wave Doppler is spectral ultrasound is a spectral ultrasound imaging technique that allows you to perform a detailed analysis of the flow in one particular spot on an ultrasound image. Its temporal resolution is much better than color flow Doppler imaging, and it allows you to generate a waveform showing how the flow velocity at a particular spot of interest varies over time. When doing pulsed wave Doppler imaging, your transducer must do three tasks simultaneously. Create and continuously update 2D grayscale ultrasound images. Create and continuously update the color Doppler box. And create and continuously update the spectral Doppler scan at the spot of interest within the color Doppler box. All of this information is usually displaced on a screen like this. The 2D grayscale ultrasound image and color Doppler box overlay are displayed in the top part of the screen. And the velocity waveform over time is continuously drawn in the lower part of the screen with the spot or sample volume where this spectral analysis is occurring indicated by a small cursor box. When doing pulsed wave Doppler imaging, there are eight parameters you'll need to control. The size of the sample volume you're doing the spectral analysis on, steering of the sample volume, which is tied to how you steered your color Doppler box, angle correction, Doppler gain, sweep speed, pulse repetition frequency, your wall filter, and map invert. Sample volume size. The sample volume size is a spot within your color Doppler box you'd like to do pulse Doppler analysis on. You'll typically plop it down right in the center of a vessel you're interrogating and adjust its size as indicated by the size of the cursor box to no greater than one third of the vessel's diameter. If the flow rates are different across the vessel diameter, a larger sample volume will sample and aggregate a wider range of velocities than a smaller sample volume. The sample volume will appear along a thin pulsed Doppler beam line, which is tied to how your color flow Doppler box was steered. Angle correction. Angle correction is important when you need to make an accurate flow velocity measurement. In an ideal world, the most accurate flow velocity measurements occur when the direction of flow is perfectly parallel with the direction of your Doppler beam. Most of the time though, while you may be able to steer the beam a little, it's usually not going to be perfectly parallel to the direction of flow. And the more the amount of this angle offset is, the more inaccurate your velocity estimates become. Angle correction, which is usually displayed as a short, thin line segment inside the sample volume box, helps the machine know how much to compensate for this velocity calculation error. Set the angle cor correction line so that it is parallel to the direction of flow. 
Doppler gain. Just like with your color Doppler box, you may also need to adjust the gain of your pulse Doppler ultrasound waveform too. If the gain is set too low, 37% here, it may be really tough to see a waveform. With a more appropriate higher Doppler gain setting, the waveform becomes nicely visible. Sweep speed. Sweep speed is basically how many times a second we're plotting velocity using our Doppler waveform. We usually choose a medium sweep speed, but for situations where things are moving very fast, for example, if you're using pulse Doppler as a tool to visually record how quickly a fetal heart is beating, a fast sweep speed may be required. Pulse repetition frequency, aka scale, is a little different than sweep speed. While sweep speed is more of a display parameter, pulse repetition frequency, or PRF, is how frequently your transducer is sending out Doppler wave fronts to sample the flow velocity. When the sampling rate is too slow, aliasing can occur, kind of like how the spokes of a spinning wagon wheel would sometimes appear stationary on a movie film running at 15 frames per second. Higher flow velocities require higher PRFs in order to avoid aliasing, and a telltale sign that aliasing is occurring is when you start seeing your pulse Doppler waveform appear to wrap around the vertical axis, like in this example here. Another hint is the color Doppler flow overlaid on your 2D grayscale ultrasound image. Notice how there's both red and blue hues in the vessel, which would seem to suggest there's rapid flow happening in both directions within the same vessel segment, which would be highly unusual. Increasing the PRF from 2500 hertz to 5000 hertz in this example corrects for the aliasing. Now, you don't want to overcompensate and choose a PRF that's too high since that will effectively squash your spectral Doppler waveform and make it tougher to analyze its shape. Wall filter. Sometimes the flow within the vessel you're interrogating may not be the only flow that's occurring on your image. Let's say that the heart is also moving nearby on the same image, for example. Extraneous nearby sources of motion may sometimes create noise in your spectral Doppler waveform, noise that can be reduced by filtering out either high or low frequency motion corresponding to how rapidly the extraneous motion is occurring, as long as the velocity of the extraneous motion is not in the same range as the flow velocity within the vessel you're studying. Finally. Invert map. Invert map basically just assigns whether flow towards your transducer will be drawn as a waveform above or, if desired, below your horizontal baseline. In addition to flipping the waveform vertically, the invert map function also permits you to move the baseline away from zero centimeters per second if you want. And that covers the 16 ultrasound acquisition parameters and controls you'll need to work with when performing most ultrasound scans and also explain why ultrasound machines have so many controls on them.